Courtney Coward, and I'm the director of the Society for the Increase of the Ministry, which is hosting this conversation today. Um, I want to just welcome you to um, another one of Sims Leadership Resource Conversations and um, just tell you a little bit about Sim um, and the next uh, gathering that we're going to have on Friday. Introduce our guests and, um, and then turn it over to my colleague, Hillary Greer who will get us going in terms of the conversation. So for those of you who are not familiar with SEM, um, the Society for the Increase of the Ministry is actually a 163 year old organization that has been dedicated to providing leadership for the Episcopal Church um, from generation to generation. Uh, we funded over 5,000 scholarships to seminarians. And we are equally committed to involved in the work of leading congregations through adaptive change. Um, we're feeling that through this technology, it's possible to lift up people with a lot of wisdom to share in our church um, who can be really helpful to us um, and be responsive to all of our needs as we are ministering through this um, uh, very challenging but also very creative and opportune uh, time. So um, I said I would mention that our next gathering is going to be on Friday at two o'clock and we're going to do, um, that's two o'clock Eastern, and we're going to do kind of a demonstration and question and answer session with Dane and Constance Perry. Um, Constance is also a member of SEM's board, and she and Dane will be sharing how they host and have hosted with hundreds of congregations over the years. Um, a really deep and transformative method of uh, hosting conversations on race, utilizing a documentary called Traces of the Trade. Um, and today, uh, we are thrilled to have um, in this time together here with Anna Wiffenden and Bishop Brian Cole. Um, we're going to be talking with them about outdoor church and so much more. Um, Anna is the founder of the church, um, the Garden Church um, in Los Angeles and Feed and Feed, Be Fed Farm, which is um, done incredible neighborhood work. She has a podcast called Food and Faith and a book entitled, This is God's Table, Finding Church Beyond the Walls. Um, we also have Bishop Brian Cole with us, who is the Bishop of Eastern Tennessee and also a member of uh, the board of the Society for the Increase of the Ministry. Brian is a really wise, creative, and faithful leader of our church, um, a bit of a Southern agrarian himself. Um, born in Missouri, and spent some time in Berea, Kentucky, employed with the Appalachian Ministry Education Resource Center. Um, he's a huge Thomas Merton fan and a Wendell Berry fan, um, and an avid reader. I highly commend following Episcopal Brian on Instagram for great um, recommendations of books. And, um, we're going to start with a reflection from um, Bishop Brian after Hillary gives us a little bit of um, guidance about sort of the spirit of our gathering and conversation today. And um, once we have a moment to, to acknowledge the fact that um, this gathering is taking place simultaneously with George Floyd's funeral in Houston. So Hillary. 
Well, it is good to see all of your faces and to be here together today. Um, in the midst of everything that's going on with George Floyd's funeral and in our country and our united focus on racial justice and its connection with all of the other justice issues that we focus on, um, we'd like to first pause at the beginning to just give ourselves time to take a breath and to breathe. And part of our focus in these webinars, and this is the first one that we planned to do so we can all see each other, is really building a community that's united in moving forward for food justice. So I'll lead us in just taking a few deep breaths together. And I invite you to put your screen on gallery view so that you can see as many people as possible. And to just put both of your feet on the floor and take a deep breath in and deep breath out feeling the feet that root you to the floor, breathing deeply in, feel the back of your ankles and your calves as you continue breathing, go up the body, feeling the back of your thighs against your chair, your hips and your lower back and see if you can feel the energy that you are drawing up from the rootedness of your feet coming up through your legs, into your hips, your pelvis, ascending through your spine, your middle back, and your upper back, and shooting forth through your head as the top of your head connects you with the sky. Feeling our bodies present in this moment, our hearts open to the heartbreak and the call of justice. And I invite you to open your eyes softly and simply look at the faces of the others who are gathered here today. You may take a moment to scroll through. And as we open this space, we open it in the context of community and in a shared commitment to justice and learning and growing and moving forward together. I'm excited to be here today with all of you to build something for the future. And it starts by asking how all of the things that we're working on are so interconnected to racial justice. And so I'd like to welcome Anna and Brian with us. And one of the, the points that, that Anna was making before we all logged on for the call is that so many of these justice issues we're talking about today and, and have been working on, many of us for years, of food justice, environmental justice, racial justice, are all intimately connected. Um, and they are leading us into what it means to be the church today. So I just, I wanted to start off by um, turning it over to Brian Cole to ground us in an opening refre reflection from Wendell Berry, and then starting off with a question for Anna. Brian? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, there's a poem by Wendell Berry and I'm going to assume we all know who Wendell Berry is. Wendell Berry is a poet and an essayist and farmer who lives in Kentucky. 
um, in in um, small rural community. He and his wife have lived there uh, since the early 60s. He's from there, but returned uh, to make a life there. He has a poem called How to Be a Poet. And I'm going to read the entire poem to you. It's three stanzas and offer a brief reflection on the second stanza. How to Be a Poet by Wendell Berry. Make a place to sit down. Sit down, be quiet. You must depend upon affection, reading, knowledge, skill, more of each than you have. Inspiration, work, growing older, patience, for patience joins time to eternity. Any readers who like your poems doubt their judgment. Breathe with unconditional breath the unconditioned air. Shun electric wire. Communicate slowly. Live a three-dimensioned life. Stay away from screens. Stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Accept what comes from silence. Make the best you can of it. Of the little words that come out of the silence, like prayers prayed back to the one who prays, make a poem that does not disturb the silence, the silence from which it came. Thinking in particular of this second stanza today, stay away from anything that obscures the place it is in. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Obviously, in the last two weeks, uh, the place where George Floyd was murdered uh, was a place that was desecrated. Uh, and now the community in Minneapolis is reclaiming that space as a, as a, as a space of, of renewal, a, a place of lament, a place of um, hopefully new promise. And as someone who's lived primarily in the Appalachian South most of my adult life, uh, it is a place of beauty, but it's a place that's known more than its fair share of ecological harm, industrial harm. And, um, and it's, I think, for me, a part of what it means to, to worship outside, not only in a time of pandemic, but to worship outside um, when so often we think about our, our spaces, our sacred spaces, our churches. Those are important places to us because they're places of safety and refuge. But knowing now for many of us to gather in person together inside uh, potentially puts each other at risk. So all of a sudden the place that is safe and sacred uh, remains sacred, but maybe not so safe. And so the idea of going outside for worship for me is a way to acknowledge that places that maybe I, I, I don't pay attention to enough, that there's a sacredness to them that we need to acknowledge by worshiping there. Uh, and knowing that some of our places, especially in the Appalachian South, uh, have experienced deep, uh, ha have been deeply harmed and scarred. And so to worship outside is also a way to, to lament and, and to begin to make amends with those places. So it's, it is good to be with you all this afternoon. I see one of my priests uh, from the diocese. Father Tim, you get five points for being on this uh, part of this podcast. So glad you're with us this afternoon. I think I turn it back either to Hillary or to Anna. Hey, thank you, Brian. Um, Anna, as Courtney mentioned, is the author of This is God's Table, Finding Church Beyond the Walls, which was recently published and chronicles some of her experience starting the church that was a garden and the garden that was a church in um, San Pedro um, neighborhood of Los Angeles. And Anna, I wanted to, to ask you to start us off perhaps with the story of your altar in that space, you know, and the coming together of different people who you had barely met and were starting, you know, what that journey was like and the symbolism of your altar being placed there in, in a very urban lot that people were coming together with you to create as a garden and church. Thanks, Hillary, and thank you. It's wonderful to be in conversation with 
with all of you. Um, and I too want to acknowledge that um, I, you know, woke up this morning and knew this was on my calendar and thought, what are we doing talking about outside church today? And um, I was just really humbled and reminded by, um, by others on this call and that of this interconnection um, of racial justice and food justice and also the interconnection and ecological justice, but also the interconnection of people and um, which connects to your, to your question, Courtney. So um, the Garden Church started um, with many months of walking the streets of San Pedro after many months prior to landing on San Pedro as a, as a place to walk. And um, I and a few others um, walked the streets and we were asking the questions of what are people hungry for and what is it that they have to offer? Um, our tagline and the name of the, the urban farm that's the nonprofit that is, is um, closely overlapped and related to the Garden Church is Feed and Be Fed. And it's this idea that everyone has something to offer and everyone has something they're hungry for. So one of the things that we were looking for were um, empty spots of land. And these are hard packed urban lots. These are not, um, um, but we also, we worshiped outdoors. So we worshiped outdoors for um, all over the city. And we finally found this, this slot of land um, in the middle of a place where there was not a lot of access to food, but also a place where there wasn't a lot of opportunity for people to come together with people they wouldn't interact with otherwise. Um, we quickly found out that there was, a, there was a big divide between the housed and unhoused um, people in that community particularly, um, which of course gets into questions of socioeconomic um, and availability and housing and all sorts of other things. So we leased this little slot of land and the very first thing we did is um, when we opened the gates on uh, May 1st, 2015 was to take a big old cedar stump, um, a round of cedar log and place it in the middle and consecrate it as God's table where all were welcome to feed and be fed. And this idea of feeding and body and mind and spirit. And then what we saw over time was what happens when you consecrate a table outside in the middle of a place in town where the middle class and wealthy people up the hill generally wouldn't come in a place where um, a lot of the neighbors are living outdoors in a place where people don't have access necessarily to fresh vegetables but certainly don't have access to growing them themselves um, but also in a place where People are hungry to be seen and to be seen as those beloved children of God. And so in feeding in body and mind and spirit, we would worship outdoors in the garden. Um, we'd work together for an hour and we'd worship together around that table and then have a big community meal we'd eat together. And um, over time that, um, which I didn't say over time it became a church. It was both a church on day one <laughs> and continues to discover what it is to be church. Um, and to be an outdoors church, an outdoor church. And so that is, um, that is where my primary context uh, um, coming to this conversation is, is, that, is that context of a church that literally didn't have walls. It had kind of walls, this, the, the buildings next to us, but it had no roof, <laughs> it had no walls on the other sides. Um, and so that the, the, the sanctuary had a, a ceiling of the sky and the ground beneath our feet. And for for some of us on the call, the idea of worshiping outside may be something that's kind of new. And um, I think one of the challenges and opportunities of COVID is that it's really been stretching us to be church and learn how to be church in in new and different ways. Um, Brian, could you talk a bit about some of the ways that um, are already being embodied in the Diocese of um, East Tennessee around worshiping outside in, in God's creation and the connection to the environment and, and creation? Sure. So um, Diocese of East Tennessee, so we encompass or, or we include the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. So again, a you know, beautiful part of creation uh, in East Tennessee. And as we have some parishes beginning to look at what it will look like to, to reopen for in-person worship, 
uh, we like every diocese or most dioceses have a COVID-19 task force looking at plans. And most of the initial plans of what parishes are planning to do uh, involve being outside. So just realizing that uh, so many of our indoor spaces uh, just eventually defeat us as we think about making them safe enough to be together. So folks are being creative about what it means to be outside uh, in worship. I think it also, um, one thing it's gonna allow our folks to do is to think about beauty in a different sort of way. Um, and, and so often that you know, there's a beauty to being indoors with stained glass or with vestments or with um, certain icons, but to, to be outdoors is another kind of beauty. So we have a, a camp and retreat center, Grace Point, and um, the director of that camp is also a priest who serves a small parish very close to that uh, camp. So they're, you know, for that church, that parish church, their regathering plan will involve moving everything to the pavilion at the camp. So it's a chance for them to worship uh, in a more safe space outdoors, in a space that's dedicated for being outdoors with the a pavilion. Those of us challenged uh, with um, not the best skin to be outside. Uh, and it, so it's been helpful for them to have that space. Um, Father Tim's parish in Carter County, uh, some other parishes are looking at initial plans where they will be outdoors by streams, outdoors maybe in dedicated space they've used in the past with labyrinths, but have used them kind of episodically, occasionally, uh, realizing now that for some time that will be a primary place where they will worship. Uh, and, and again, knowing that you'll have to think through, it's not simply a matter of going out, you know, you know taking, taking the liturgy and going outside, it's also maybe even rethinking what it looks like then to worship once you're outdoors. That are there ways in which um, you then even maybe rethink parts of the liturgy, make, make use of that, uh, the prayers of the people that might be shaped differently by being outside. Uh, but it's allowing them to, to, I think, greatly increase the sense of safety, uh, knowing that folks are hungry, if nothing else, just to see each other. So I think to be socially distanced in lawn chairs, to be socially distanced uh, on a landscape uh, really is a way for people to realize that what's as, as important for them as, as the sacrament of Eucharist is just the sacrament of seeing each other and not seeing each other on a Zoom call, but to see each other, um, as, as Wendell Berry says, you know, with, with depth, with a 3D depth. Um, so, so most of the, our places that are gonna try anything right now uh, will be outside. Thank you. And as, as we were talking before the call, um, all of us who were involved together in, in leading and speaking had various wonderings about this time and what it means to live into, you know, doing church outside. And, um, you know, as, you know, to the subtitle of Anna's book, Finding Church Beyond the Walls. And, going to the places that teach us how to be church. So I would like to invite all of you, if you have wonderings or things that are very much on your heart and minds, to feel free to enter them into the chat box. And we're going to have a free form conversation with, with Anna and Brian. And we'll invite you to, to unmute yourself um, if there is something in the chat box that looks like it, it needs to be said. Um, and I'll say one of the wonderings that, that we had was about um, the opportunity that outdoor worship can create to acknowledge the history of the land that where we are and the people that um, originally belonged to what the history of that place has been. Um, and Anna had some thoughts on that. And I just wanted to, to invite her to share and any of you who may be wondering in similar directions. Uh, so um, one of my current hats is I'm the Protestant chaplain at Amherst College. And one of the things that we have um, did throughout the fall was what we called holy hikes. And this is um, something that um, just a uh, Reverend Justin Cannon out of the Diocese of San Francisco initiated this idea a number of years ago. And I see Jimmy um, on the call. He's been part of some of our holy hikes here, which has uh, been great. But the idea is just to take the liturgy, 
outside on a hike and it's, it's moving liturgy. Um, and one of the things that was immediately so obvious is that, of course, there would need to be a land acknowledgement at the beginning. And I had just moved to the area. So it was like, okay, I got to get on it. I got to find out about this land that I'm about to take these college students out on to hike on. Um, and um, I think it's a really, it's an invitation to both see what, what is the land in our communities around us. So maybe it's your front lawn of your church. And um, I know that, um, you know, there's something different between sitting inside our church buildings or sitting on the front steps. And if you spend an hour on the front steps of your community, you're going to learn a different slice of what your community is, is like. And, and, um, and to be able to worship outdoors gives that opportunity to see your current community. But it also gives us an opportunity to dig more deeply to say, what are the stories this land holds? Who are the peoples that have cultivated this land in the past, who have lived on it? What are the factors that have desecrated it in the past to you know, the, the Wendell Berry poems point? And to do some more research and some, some pondering and some reflecting on the land itself. Um, and that by having our liturgy and our worship, that intentional time of being present and of noticing and acknowledging God's presence with us, that it actually leads and invites us into asking more of those questions and to being curious about that very land that we, we put our feet on. Thank you. So I'm, a, I'm looking at some of the chat questions. Mm -hmm. um, so on, on Sunday, I'll be at Ascension in Knoxville and they're gonna have a sound system. Um, because again, I think that's a great practical question about people's ability to hear. Uh, I went to a peaceful protest in Oak Ridge, Tennessee the other day, and um, it was a great day and the, and, the, and the mic didn't work, you know, so all these great speakers that four people were able to hear. Um, and so I do think if, if you're going to think about being outdoors, being mindful of, of that really practical piece of, you know, can you have a sound system? Can you really project? to include people. Um, and then the question around, you know, people who can't participate and how would you Zoom that? Um, something I'm aware of, um, something I'm aware of is, and I've already said this, some of our clergy in our diocese, that, that what in-person gathering might look like might not be what you'd want to Zoom because all of a sudden you do have sort of, there are these people gathered and I'm watching them gather by Zoom, and I think what's been helpful about Zoom worship is we're all in the same in a space connected in that way. So it might be that what you, you know, an outdoor worship might be something for people who can gather safely outdoors, knowing that churches will need to continue to keep people connected by Zoom, that that might be a different platform, even a different offering, uh, knowing that otherwise, you know, I become an incredibly passive participant watching other people worship outside. Um, I, I see also a question about how can we make these spaces more accessible to folks who have difficulty with, with mobility? Um, I, well, I just, I think it's, it's one of the things that I think is um, any of our worship spaces are problematic in different ways. So going on a hike in a mountain is not accessible to some people. Being inside a building right now with potential of being exposed is not accessible to many others. Um, and so I think these are really, really important questions. And one of the things that I often come back to is that I don't know that there's one fits all solution. I think it's the questions that are important of how do we how do we make things as accessible as possible? And my kind of um, guess, which makes me tired, <laughs> um, is that in this season, it's going to mean doing more things. You know, it's like Mr. Brian said, like maybe it means that there's there's a live stream and there's an in-person or um, I, I'm uh, doing some transition work right now with the church and we're looking at drive-in worship. They're not even ready to do outdoors yet. Um, so maybe they'll listen to this webinar and we'll, we'll figure it out. But, um, and 
and you know, and we're looking at live streaming, like you said, not the not all the people, but just just the upfront outside. Um, so I think one of the things outdoor worship has taught me, though, that is relevant to this is it's messy and it's not it's not a perfect thing and it's not it's it's never smooth, you know, the sirens go by and you have to stop and you have to pray. The wind takes the easy up tents and tips them over. The, you know, somebody walks by and, you know, makes comments, right? Like it's, it's this reminder that we are, we worship in the midst of our community, in the midst of our world and that it won't, it, it'll be messy. So, um, I think those are all really important questions. I don't have a, like by any means any singular answers, but I think that to keep exploring and, and being creative and, and asking who, who's being left out this way? Who's being left out this way? Who's being left out this way? How do we, how do we create those spaces? Yeah. And I, th I think what you're saying, Anna, about the chaos of outdoor worship is so true for all of us <laughs> now, whether we're doing Zoom worship or Facebook Live, there's a certain chaos to it, which can be freeing if we don't try to do liturgy in the same way we did it before, but now we're just doing it online. Um, there can be a certain freedom for us in saying we can't do what we used to do. We have to come up with, with new ways and the opportunity to be creative and, and to just experiment you know, music that makes community has been running online practice groups for people who are trying to figure out how to still make music together, even though we can't sing hymns in unison. Um, you know, and, and the two principles they use that I love is they say, you know, just let go of what we used to do. We all love it. We all miss it. We can't do it together on Zoom. So, you know, let it go. And the second is to approach everything with the spirit of noticing. What did we notice there? And we may notice that was awkward and weird, or that was super uncomfortable. Um, and we may notice, I thought that was gonna fall apart, but it actually turned out to be beautiful. And that we're being taught how to do liturgy in new ways. And if we bring this spirit of learning to all that we're doing, then how much richer our whole liturgical sensibility will be wherever we're worshiping now and in the future. Um, and I see, I see Lanny had a great um, point about her community beginning with um, a land acknowledgement of being done on the ancestral land of the, um, is it the Anishinaabe people? Um, uh, from the Upper Peninsula of, of Michigan. Can you say a little bit about how your community came to start using that and, and what that mm -hmm. sensibility is? Yes, absolutely. I love being here. Thank you, everybody. Um, this is such an exciting topic because we're a new Episcopal community. We're also partnered with the ELCA as a new church plant. So we're missionaries in the field trying to do that. We were a year ago started doing outdoor work worship, focused primarily on young adults who were no longer going to church. And what we found that we had to be having these conversations um, and we had to be doing them outside, really outside the walls of church because the young adults weren't going to go inside church. Um, and we started, we have a very strong Anishinaabe Ojibwe community up here. And it's very important to our Episcopal diocese to recognize the land acknowledgement. So we begin every service with just saying we are on this land and um, we honor that. Mm -hmm. And just in saying that really just opens it up to the respect that we have for not only the people who lived here, but also the whole congregation that lives outside the walls of church, the paper birch trees, the Lake Superior. And we have this honorable respect for them as we worship together with them. Um, and it really does bring a lot of um, life into your worshiping. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. That's really helpful to hear. Um, I see some very specific questions, too, about one, um, passing the plate, or, or I think it's really how do you receive contributions and encourage contributions when you're outside, and particularly in the time of COVID. 
and um, some very specific questions from Lori about virus safety, wearing masks, um, you know, singing indoors and outdoors. And Brian, I'm imagining that if your diocese is like my diocese, you have been engaged in creating a long list of guidelines and suggestions for people on things like that. Could you speak to that? Yeah, we we have. We had a task force to put together our document. And I think the thing that we're, I think we all know that for many, for many of us, we're so far outside of our lane in trying to even think through some of these questions. So we're needing to be generous with each other. Um, you know, I think this Sunday, I've been made aware that my um, person on my staff, who's our diocesan communicator, is also a really fine singer. So I think he will be the music this Sunday. So even though we're outside, I think we're only going to have a soloist. So um, I think right now, the things that also kind of really um, maybe provide extra caution and extra care become important symbols right now. Um, I'm planning to take my mask with me on Sunday. Uh, I think while I'm preaching, again, I'll be outside when I'm preaching. Uh, I'll probably plan to take it off, but otherwise I will wear it in as much as, again, of a symbol of care for each other. So I think, um, I think, you know, those things that provide extra caution, extra care, I'm aware that, again, even before COVID-19, uh, that we are in parishes with people who deal with anxiety. Uh, years ago, I remember a woman wanted to be baptized uh, this is when I was in Lexington, Kentucky, but she also had major anxiety issues. And she was like, I, you know, would it be okay if I was baptized without any witnesses? And we finally kind of worked up to kind of a, a way in which it was a, a public worship and a baptism, but also acknowledging for her, uh, she had real anxiety issues around being that, that seen by a community. And so I think to, to, to acknowledge that that all that many of us now maybe have a, a deep a deeper level of anxiety around care and concern for each other. So, I think to continue to be masked outside or to, to have caution around singing, for some people becomes also I think just a way of caring for them. Um, and so to be careful about how we sing or be careful about how we, um, you know, I think to be outside is to be much safer. Uh, but but at the same time, I think to to practice good. Um, to practice really important and good safety there is also, I think, a witness to our care for the other and care for those who are weakest among us. Thank you. And of course, as we're talking about being beyond the walls of our church, there's the physical walls and, and being outside. And, and there's also sort of the social and, and mental walls of our church and, and the ways that we close ourselves off um, to, to our community, to, to people from different backgrounds, from people from other communities that may be right on our doorstep. Um, and, and in Anna's book and in the, the garden ministries that we've been doing these webinars as part of, food justice is an inherent part of that as well as looking at how gardens can become a crossroads for communities of people who don't often come together, coming into relationship and um, building something new and something different together. So I wanted to, to ask Anna, for, for those of us on, our, on the call, and it seems like we have a mixture of folks who are involved in wild, wild church and holy hikes who are thinking maybe of outdoor ministry for the first time or who that's the typical way that we worship. What, what would some of your suggestions be for ways that we should be thinking of in terms of stepping beyond our mental walls um, and the social walls to really to be open, welcoming and bridge building places rather than saying, oh, well, the door's open, anyone can come. Um, the kind of, rad I'm thinking of the radical hospitality that you really embodied in San Pedro by going out into the community. Yeah. So when I was in seminary um, years ago, I um, 
did a contextual education course to England and Scotland and we did Iona and we did all these wonderful, you know, monastery kind of places. Um, but then I spent a day with a priest in um, Sheffield and I honestly didn't know that much about Church of England and how things work and their quality. And he said, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to show you my uh, parish. And I said, great. And my classmate and I who were like good, you know, North American Protestants were expected to drive to the church and instead he drove us all over town and showed us the elementary school and the jail and the, you know, football, uh, the football fields, not the football fields. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and then finally we got to his, his church building and it really, it changed my thinking about my own call. Who did I want to be to my community? And I wanted to it was like, I want to be that the pastor to the parish, to the community. Um, and so one of the first things we did, I mentioned this earlier, is we actually, and by we, I was meant, me and a few random people I convinced to come and, you know, come to come try this way is, is to actually walk the streets prayerfully and noticing and paying attention. And I think that that's something that um, is actually a great COVID exercise. <laughs> Like we can walk one by one through the streets of our neighborhoods and notice and notice who is there, who isn't there. You know, we were looking again for empty lots and food sources and, and such, but we were also acknowledging that this, this is our community. And I think that by taking our worship outdoors, if we're a church that primarily worships in an indoor sanctuary, we are widening our parish, right? We are widening what it means to be church in our community. And you might be a church that is, you know, post COVID generally gonna worship inside those walls and that's fine. I'm not anti-church building actually. <laughs> I think they're really useful, um, especially in these climates where it gets cold. Um, but that when we take our liturgy outdoors, when we take our liturgy to the streets and we are noticing what and who and how is this bigger community operating around us, that it actually changes the way that we are church, both inside our buildings on someday on a Sunday morning, but also what are the organizations we're getting involved in? What are the ministries we're supporting? Um, and how are we actually seeing that image of God in all people? How are we seeing that beloved community? Um, one of my very favorite parts of the liturgy, well, actually the, not just of the garden church everywhere, was the time of communion and Eucharist and um, which is not a big surprise to this group but the thing at the garden church that was specifically beautiful to me is that I would walk out and first you know serve people around the table and then I keep walking out further and further all the way out to the gates to the sidewalk if there was somebody standing outside the gate on the sidewalk I'd walk out you know and like that physicality of saying you know beloved child of God like this is the body of Christ to the random person who's hanging outside, outside the gates, that changed church, you know, that changed worship and liturgy. And I, I think we, this is something that is a beautiful thing that can happen if you just take your church, you know, liturgy outdoors for the summer. <laughs> um, and I think that same thing. Um, I was thinking another place I've experienced outdoor church, which is a much more traditional setting is um, Harcourt Parish, which is on Kenyon's campus in Ohio. They do mass on the grass all summer. And so they're in the middle of a college campus. And it's summer, but there's still people walking by. And that's changed things too. You know, that there's there's something about being with the broader community, not set apart, but being with that I think um, can help us to shift the way that we see one another. Oh, you're muted, Hillary. <laughs> Thanks. Um, David was asking to hear more about um, how the urban god garden got its start um, and what wisdom you might share with parishes who are discerning whether to start a parish garden. Sure. I mean, so 
the Episcopal Church does an amazing job with resources in this area, and I'm sure that um, Hillary and Courtney can put more links more quickly in the <laughs> chat than I could even think. But um, I mean, I, you had the Good News Gardens on the other week, so there are a lot of practical. There are a lot of practical resources um, for how to do that, and my basic answer to the question is. Yes, discern if it's something you should do. <laughs> you know, take that that effort. I I see very few downsides, but I am a little bit biased um, in that way. Um, I think it's a I think it's a different set of processes that a, an existing parish goes through to start a garden than I went through to start a garden and church at the same time. So um, this is in some ways outside of it's not my area of expertise, but I can encourage the discernment of it and can point to um, many wonderful resources, um, and I'd be happy to, to search some of those up and put them in the, in the chat in a minute too, um, for, for how to, to do that. But I guess the, the, the one thing I can offer is that, um, to believe that it is part of church, it is part of you being church, and it is not a project that the church is doing, but it's actually to embed it in the life of your community and to, worship in that space to believe that putting our hands in the dirt and growing our food and sharing that food is a way that we can experience the sacred and that there is something deeply profound and um and sacramental in in making those connections and i think that's something we were talking about earlier too that we're all missing these tangible physical things and maybe if we worship outdoors, you know, probably still can't share the bread, but we could all put our hands on the soil to, together. And we probably can't still pass the peace, but we could notice the breeze together. And those ways of, um, of engaging the elements can connect us in that way. I could jump in here for a second. I'm, I mean, listening to you talk, Anna, and some of the questions and comments, I'm, I'm thinking there is a kind of an undercurrent in the conversation about evangelism and um, sort of the, the, uh, the impact and implications of outdoor church. I think, you know, this, the, the thought was really sparked by what Lonnie said um, initially about this, the connection between um, reaching people who would not otherwise come to church. And um, I'm also remembering, Brian, when you were, before you were a bishop, when you were in Lexington um, and visiting you in Lexington and um, just walking around the neighborhood with you, um, you know, being very aware, you know, we're going to lunch or going to the bookstore or whatever that um, it seemed like there was like a relationship with the wider community there. And I wonder how, like now that you're a bishop, and uh, you know, how do you, how do you see the connection between our relationship to our church buildings and our wider communities? The whole question of how we reach, um, we reach more people and establish relationships with more people than we have in the past. Sure. Um, I love being a bishop, but I miss being a parish priest and having that connection to one neighborhood and one community. And um, when Susan and I lived in Lexington, we bought a house in the neighborhood where the church, where the Good Shepherd Church is, and I walked everywhere and ended up, I, there were people that I did funerals for because they saw some giant priest walking past their house and they didn't have a parish connection, but their father had died. And with the priest who walked by my house all the time, would you do my dad's funeral? And so to me, there was a pastoral care nature of walking a neighborhood and knowing a space. So I, I think, you know, we've, we've done a good job in Zoom worship, but to think about pastoral care and, and care for a community. So I think both outdoor worship, but also thinking about people maybe in a parish that could walk the neighborhood uh, it, it, that whole practice of sort of walking the bounds of the parish, that to me, it's a way to get to know the neighborhood. Um, as a bishop, I've said to my folks, just like, you know, in the film Jaws, when he has to get a bigger boat, um, as a bishop, I had to get a bigger map. 
of, of the place where I serve. And, you know, I have to, now my Subaru is, you know, how I get around and I don't like my footprint uh, being that big, big as far as the carbon. Um, but I, I do think to me, what's essential in parish ministry is do you know the parish? Do you know the place? And again, it's why Wendell Berry is so important to me is that sense of place. And so I, I, I hope maybe if we begin to worship outdoors and maybe hold on to that, that, that even more of us will have a sense of ministry being connected to place and what you can see. Um, Cause when I was in Lexington, so Good Shepherd is on main street. So if you wanted to drive to the Holy of Holies, uh, to Rupp Arena to watch UK basketball, you have to drive past Good Shepherd Church to do that. So it is like Main Street. And people would ask me, you know, they'd see me in a college and they'd say, who are you? I was like, well, I'm the, I'm the parish priest at Good Shepherd. They'd say, well, where is that? It would say it's on Main Street. They still couldn't see it. I mean, it was on Main Street. And so I think often as Episcopalians, we think, you know, we're incredibly welcoming Everyone knows how welcoming and inclusive we are, but I think we go behind our doors and they have no idea what we do back there. And so I think to be outside, to worship outside, to be, to be in the neighborhood is maybe finally to be seen. So I think for a lot of folks, for, for a lot of people, I think the Episcopal Church, we're a club. You have to already be a member. Um, and so I think to be outdoors, just like Anna has said, is a chance for us to, to really be seen and to be present to people. And um, so for me, walk in the neighborhood is a, an essential part of ministry. I mean, if I could just quickly ask another little follow-up that's just kind of on my mind because of, it was interesting, this whole question of what is the parish? You know, is it, is it the, the church building that we think of as the parish or more in the the manner of the Church of England because it's an established church is the parish the whole you know the whole neighborhood the whole community um, are you the pastor to everyone and you're in this kind of geographical sphere um, I was I, I've had many conversations with folks whose the mix of people in there, in that geographical sphere, um, in the neighborhood of their congregations is changing because of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, because of the, of the movement of protesters and marchers and demonstrators who, um, who have, you know, in some ways turn to churches to support them with water and, you know, in various ways to, um, to support their demonstrations. And there have been some really interesting conversations about um, how, what is the relationship there? And I wonder, you know, Anna and Brian, if you could sort of imagine being in that situation, given your understanding of church. Um, how would you view the, the church's relationship to a group who, um, you know, for whatever reason, kind of showed up on the doorstep um, because of something, something changed um, in the larger context? And I mean, how, how, would, you, how would you relate how would you think about relating to folks under the, so some circumstances like that? Anna, you want to take the first crack at that? I was going to say my internet connection is unstable, so you're going to have to start. You're going to have to start off. Is that a good, good excuse for you to take sure. it? Sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I can do that. Um, so I'm a great admirer of Sam Wells, who was the dean at Duke. Uh, University Chapel in Durham, and um, he had an article years ago about sort of all ministry is improv now. So I think, and I think COVID-19 is like improv on steroids, but, um, you know, to me, I think so much of ministry is improv, that you're sort of doing your life, and you think this is your call, and then people show up, and now you need to be doing something else um, because of, because they, they got in your way, and yet they were the next thing God wanted you to do. Um, 
when I was at Good Shepherd, we got involved in this kind of really off the wall um, public art installation around sound where they wanted to play um, Nirvana's teen spirit on our church bells every afternoon at, at a certain time. And it was connected to Kurt Cobain and suicide. And um, so we said, sure, we have church bells and I think we could play Nirvana on them. And, and um, out of it, like this, there's now this whole suicide survivor group that meets there and like all kinds of ministries came from people saying, you have church bells and can we play Nirvana on them? So I think, I think a church that's open to that kind of improv is a church that's going to be alive and, and is going to survive the pandemic as far as livelihood, because you're open to what people need as opposed to, you know, fit into this box. Um, I think all of our boxes are sort of breaking right now, but I think the more the church can be open to what's next, especially if, again, that person's coming from the neighborhood um, is a way for us to, to realize we, we continue to um, share the good news by first finding out what, what news people need to share with us. So. That's beautifully, that's a beautiful example. And I, I feel like it connects to me with that question back with feed and be fed of what are people hungry for and what do they have to offer? And the church had to offer church bells, but the pers the hunger was an acknowledge acknowledgement of something so much deeper, right? And that's um, beautiful, I guess. And I guess my response with, in, to Courtney's question in um, conjunction with that is just that if we're connected with our community that we're embedded in, and if we're embedded in that community, then the community will let us know, right? And there's no us, it's, it's all of us. It's not the church and the community, it's here we are, we're being the church in our community. And I think it's very contextual, It'll look really different in different areas. But if the assumption is that the church is a place where community and connection and belovedness and feeding in body and mind and spirit happen, then I think those things happen naturally and they there's no cookie cookie cutter it's going to be contextual based on those relationships and relationships that were already you know rich and established and relationships that start in a new moment but if the church has established itself as as that kind of place that um that that can happen in in these moments of crisis thank you and looking at the ways that the church can and, and is responding um, to the issues of our communities in times of crisis and um, when they're not garnering national headlines, I'd like to ask Brian Sellers Peterson to uh, unmute himself and share a little bit about the next webinar that's being planned, which focuses specifically on issues of food justice. Brian? Hi, everyone. Um, just wanted you to know that uh, we've got lined up for the new two next uh, conversations on June 23rd and July 7th. We're going to have Darrell uh, Harris from the Black Food Security Network. Um, he's uh, at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore and uh, a minister in a church in the area, but runs a, um, a nationwide um, network for Black food security uh, through uh, primarily African American churches. And the the second uh, webinar will be with uh, Robert and Richie Tubles uh, from South Minneapolis. Uh, they are at um, uh, All Saints Indian Mission, and also run the first people's kitchen um, and this is the same neighborhood where um, George Floyd was murdered in South Minneapolis. Robert also serves as the, the indigenous missioner uh, for the Diocese of Minnesota. So uh, stay tuned. Um, we'll get information about which seminar is first, uh, but they both said they're willing to 
um, participate in the conversation. And um, once you get the information, I'm going to count on all of you to spread the news. So um, I'm glad I could join for part of this today. Great. Thanks, it's, Hillary. It's great to have you with us, Brian. Thanks. Thanks for being here to be part of this. I'm going, we're, your guys are going back to Fred and Barney, my chickens. Okay, bye. <laughs> chickens, Fred and Barney. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's now four o'clock and we'd like to thank you all for, for being here with us. As Brian mentioned, those are our next two upcoming webinars and we're hoping to give people a chance to interact, to get to know each other more as we build community and build a movement um, towards food justice together um, and ask how we continue, can continue to deepen this work. So Brian had to leave to get to a diocesan finance committee that started. Uh, we'd like to thank him and thank Anna. And Jim Goodman will be, yes, thank you very much. Um, and Jim Goodman will be closing us with a final reflection. Thank you, Hillary. This is a reading from Isaiah 58, that part of Isaiah that's after the exile where the Jewish people realized or came to slowly realize that God dwells not just in the temple. Is this not rather the fast that I choose, releasing those bound unjustly, untying the thongs of the yoke, setting free the oppressed and breaking off every oak? Is it not sharing your bread with the hungry bringing the afflicted and the homeless into your house, clothing the naked when you see them, not turning your back on your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, your wound shall quickly be healed, and your vindication shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer, you shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. Amen. Thank you, Jim. And thank you all for being here. We hope you're able to join us on Friday for the conversation with Constance and Dane Perry around opening conversations um, around the legacy of race and racism and for our future webinars, and you'll be getting emails about those. So thank you very much, all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye.